tonight we are considering one of the um, largest American uh, female writers, who is Kate Chopin. Uh, she lived and wrote in at the at the end of the 18th century, sorry, at the end of the 19th century and the beginning and mid 20th century. Um, she was an outstanding figure, and before going ahead or going on on her biography. I would like to explain you, or tell, uh, I would like to talk to, with you, talk to you about four um, cardinal virtues women of the time had to hold, okay, so that we get a clear image of what, uh, what how was to be a woman of the time, uh, a woman of the time. Um, piety, okay, sounds strange, but is this word piety and um, they have to be um, they have to be piety they um, pious. pious yeah okay. okay they have to be pious religion was uh, a main tool of the time to control women longings and desires and it doesn't take them away from the proper sphere which was home okay then purity Virginity was the largest treasure of the women of that time. They had to keep it until the marriage night. Um, submission. Submission to their husbands, brothers, uh, male figures. They had to be under them and treat them as superior because it was appointed by God, right? And they had no rights, no will and no power, basically. And yes. Yes. <laughs> Domesticity was another uh, virtue they had to hold. As we have mentioned before, uh, their proper sphere was home and they need to take care of their husbands and children and lower or middle class women of the time had to um, cook, uh, attend people at home, um, making beds, uh, tending flowers, uh, doing needlework, right? Upper classes, they had a different education. They needed to know how to play an instrument. They had drawing classes. They learned how to dance in public. They had to be beautiful as an ornament to the husband, okay? So, it wasn't the, the same considered. It depends on your class level. So before going on or going ahead uh, with uh, her biography, I want to I want you to keep this in mind. Okay, this was the frame of mind of a normal women of the time. Okay, so. So, we move on. The feminist content. Okay. Not so loud, maybe. Kate Chopin and feminist, right? A bit overview about her biography. This is a picture of Kate Chopin. Hi, Kate. Hey, Katie. <laughs> okay. Kate Chopin was born in St. Louis, Missouri, in the 1850. She was born Kate O'Flaherty. Katie's father, Thomas O'Flaherty, died in a train accident when Kate was only five years old. Kate was raised during the Civil War and lived with her mother, grandmother, and great grandmother, all widowed. <laughs> all widows. Widows. All widows. In 1870, when Kate was 20, she married Oscar Chopin. And by 1878, they had seven children, six boys and one girl. Fortunately, he died in 1882 of malaria. <laughs> to support her family, Kate moved home to live with her mother and began writing when she was 38. 
luckily for us, for us. Kate Pin published over 100 stories, essays, and sketches in literary magazines. She is best known for her novels At Fault, published in 1819, and The Awakening, published in 1899. The feminist content and message of The Awakening caused an uproar which hurt Kate in the remaining years of her life. She wrote only a few short stories and only two were published. She died in 1904. During her life, Kate never viewed herself as a feminist, nor, nor as suffragist. She saw herself as a modern writer and took women very seriously. She never doubted women's ability to be strong. Feminist is the belief and aim that women should have the same rights, power and opportunities as men. Women's suffrage was a political movement to give women the right, the right to vote. Okay, it was passed in 1890. Despite the fact that Kate Chopin didn't view herself as a feminist, her portrayal of women as strong and capable and equal to men certainly was counterculture for that time. Okay. <laughs> okay. On um, points I would like to, to point out about her biography is that she was surrounded by women. Okay, she knew very well women's uh, psychological traits and she exploited that at the time of writing. Now we're going to comment or consider some of the comments um, readers, critics, important people of the time made about her writing. Her female character startled readers. Edna in The Awakening says, I had got into a habit of expressing myself. It doesn't matter to me and you may think me unwomanly if you like. Some critics commented, she had betrayed her calling, this was gilded dirt. Her material could hardly be described in language fit for publication. Her tone was unhealthy and morbid. Her influence potentially dire. The worst of such stories is that they will come into the hands of youth, leading them to dwell on things that only mature persons can understand, and promoting unholy imaginations and unclean desires. She should have flirted less and looked after her children more, refraining from pointing a moral. One more clever author gone wrong. You see, it's very interesting how Kate uses Edna's, who is the awakening heroine, to express and tell what she thought, okay, what she wanted to basically. But that wasn't, um, people didn't like it, okay, because it was too advanced for the time. If we pay attention to some of the adjectives used to describe her, okay, they say unholy, unwomanly, potentially dire, unfit, unclean desires, uh, unholy imaginations, nothing potentially dire, which means very bad, okay, um, and the last part is amazing. She should have taken care more of her children and flirted less. So that was the moral of the time, okay? And that is showing that is showing us how uh, advanced and um, forward she was. So let's go a little bit further. Okay, we ready? Are you ready? I'm ready. I'm ready. Okay. Some more comments on her work. As the nation's reviewers sum up, the awakening is the sad story of a southern lady who wanted to do what she wanted to. From wanting to, she did, with disastrous consequences. Both author and heroine, in short, have willfully pursued unwomanly ends. <coughs> So, not only Kate Chopin did with her life what she wanted to, 
but also she used her characters to project what she, where, where she wanted to get to, okay? And again, we see a womanly ends, everything which is out of their idea of what a, 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 a good woman should be was spun as a womanly. Okay, let's go ahead now with some positive <coughs> comments. Her work was a consummate art, the development of a soul, an awakening to the possibilities of life, an emancipation of the whole being from the trammels of conventionalism. She explored dimensions of experience outside the conventional limit preferred by editors in stories often as impressive in their nuance and subtlety as others are in their forthright openness. In Vogue, which is the magazine of the time, was said, Mrs. Chopin is daring in her choice of themes, but exquisitely refined in the treatment of them, and her literary style is a model of terse, which means brief, and finished <coughs> diction, She's an artist with a courageous soul that dares and defies her stories with courageous souls, both men and women. Okay, now we see the other side. Some people liked the way she, she was writing and she was described here as a consummate art. Her work was, was considered to be a consummate art and emancipation out of the trammels of conventionalism. Um, she broke the limits and she was daring not only in her themes but in her literary style at the time of writing. Um, courageous souls that dares to go ahead of her time and her writing. So the, I like this very much, this comments very much. Some of the topics she was working in her work. Again, they say she's a poet and storyteller that was telling the truth about marriage. Okay, this is a very picky uh, topic. Men were seldom Prince Charmings and few women <coughs> angels of loveliness and marriage not the union of two souls as they were taught in the romantic literature. It is a union of two people drawn together by physical attraction who look forward to a fool's paradise of happiness but who find to their disgust a dull, commonplace world of wearing routine. Its fundamental excuse for being is the perpetuation of the species and not self-gratification of any kind. Okay, this is a revolutionary idea, right? She is depicting, telling straight ahead what was a real marriage, what a real marriage was, right? So, she, she goes ahead. She also talks or, or, or treats, she also treats some other uh, topics like love, adultery, motherhood. Uh, again, she explains clearly that fairy tale stream or romantic fulfillment is not true, it's not going to, to work anymore. Okay? For her, marriage is a disappointment nothing like what the storybooks promise after the wedding. Okay, she reflects on some of her characters, especially in Edna's case. She sees a wedding as one of the most lamentable spectacles on earth. Edna's own wedding, wedding was an accident, a combination of frustration, self-delusion, and a chance to annoy her family. But more troubling still, perhaps, so too is her love affair, an extramarital affair. 
Her passion, not after all, as some readers would like to believe, Sleeping Beauty's awakening or the transformation of a domestic prisoner into a divinity. It is the end of married life which brings visions of freedom. And it is the, her husband's return that what kills her. So she was so happy to be free that once the husband, husbands come back, she doesn't want to live anymore. Okay? She tasted the she tasted freedom. freedom. So she wanted to go on doing her own will. Kate Chopin's consciousness raising titles. The storm was too advanced, so advanced for any 19th century magazine audience. It remained among her papers until the 1960s. Okay, it deals with adultery openly. Okay, so and it doesn't give a moral at the end like, okay, she was an adulteress, but eventually she died or something bad happened to her, right? It's, it doesn't work like that. It opens or it deals with ad uh, adultery openly, like in real life, it does. In The Awakening, Edna Pontelier doesn't fit in her marriage and her mother motherhood. She needs to escape and experience what surrounds her breaking the established norms for a proper wife. In La Belle Soraide, <coughs> she is robbed of love, child, reason, and within the slave owning South. Okay? She is showing different realities. Individuals trapped in limiting personal relationships. Okay. In Sabine, Tid Ryan's illiteracy keeps her tied to a violent white drunkard man. Okay. Her illiteracy. In At Fall, Kate Chopin tackles with female alcoholism. It's the first time, and ahead of his time, divorce. In Vagabonds and an Egyptian cigarette, cigarette, the stories hint at forbidden knowledge, ventured through contact with a male wanderer outside the marriage, right? Darkness, visions, dreams, and she never, she never saw them in print. She didn't find a publisher. In young there, was, there was no Mujer Palabra. I would have published her. That's, that's <laughs> In Young Dr. Goss, her strongest work was hard to place and it was fin finally destroyed. Then there is no copy. No copy of it. Not a single one. Terrible. Got goosebumps. <laughs> <laughs> Exploring less than idolized human relationships. In Miss McKenders, the, the, um, the book was turned down for its open attack on wealthy people, basically, right? Of, on fashionable philanthropy and the direct questions about the orange of a true life billionaire's wealth. The idea is, um, are the rich happy? Is it all as it seems? Okay, so she eventually published the story but under a pseudonym, not with her proper name. Beyond the bayou, the Christ she depicts or tackles with the crisis of psychological trauma. Very profound, very deep, openly. In Lilacs, it's a story which sympathetically presents a disruptive, disruptive model of a divided self. Okay? So none of these topics fit with at uh, the time. So, in my opinion, she's one of the greatest. She was out of time. If you give me some time, some extra time, I would like to share with you the end, okay, of the awakening. Right? In, in this story, she, she was married to a man who didn't love her very much. 
and um, every time he came back from work, he he was telling uh, Edna how bad mother she was, and she spent most of the nights crying in bed. Okay, she felt so unhappy. So um, eventually, she met a young man. She, they fall in love, uh, but he went away, and. He returned back and then she didn't want him, not the husband, not the new lover, right? So eventually she she took um, she she thought she wanted to stop the way she was living. She wanted a new life. So this was this was the result of her decision, right? We're gonna start reading from the water, <coughs> the water of the Gulf. Right? The water of the gulf stretched out before her, gleaming with the million lights of the sun. The voice of the sea is seductive, never ceasing, whispering, clamoring, murmuring, inviting the soul to wander in abysses of solitude. All along the white beach, up and down, there was no living thing in sight. A bird with a broken wing was beating the air above, drilling, fluttering, circling, disabled down, down to the water. Edna had found her own bathing suit still hanging, faded upon its accustomed peg. She put it on, leaving her clothing in the bathhouse. But when she was there, beside the sea, absolutely alone, she cast the unpleasant, pricking garments from her, and for the first time in her life, she stood naked in the open air, at the mercy of the sun, the breeze that beat upon her, and the waves that invited her. How strange and awful it seemed to stand, stand naked under the sky, how delicious! She felt like some newborn creature, opening its eyes in a familiar world that it had never known. The foamy wavelets curled up to her white feet and coiled like serpents about her ankles. She walked out. The water was chill, but she walked on. The water was deep, but she lifted her body, her white body, and reached out with a long <coughs> sweeping stroke. The touch of the sea is senseless, enfolding the body in its soft, close embrace. She went on and on. She remembered the night she swam <coughs> far out and recalled the terror that seized her at the fear of being unable to regain the shore. She did not look back now, but went on and on thinking of the blue grass meadow that she had traversed when a little child, believing that it had no beginning and no end. Her arms and legs were growing tired. She thought of Leonce, husband, and the children. They were a part of her, of her life, but they need not have thought that they could possess her her body and soul. How Mademoiselle Rice would have laughed, perhaps sneered, if she knew. And you call yourself an artist. What pretensions, madam? The artist must possess the courageous soul that dares and defies. The sostium was pressing upon and overpowering her. Goodbye, because I love you. He did not know, he did not understand, he would never understand. Perhaps Dr. Mandelet would have understood if she had seen him, but it was too late. The shore was far behind her, and her strength was gone. She looked into the distance, and the old terror flamed up for an instant, then sunk again. 
Edna heard her father's voice and her sister's Margaret's. She heard the barking of an old dog that was chained to the sycamore tree. The spurs of the cavalry officer clanked as he walked across the porch. There was the hum of bees and the musky odor of pinks filled the air. <coughs> Okay. Okay. Did you understand the yes. end? The end. The ending. Okay. Her decision was to finish with the kind of life she was living. Right. She, she, she defies and dared, as, as she said before. So, no doubt, no doubt, she she uh, raised the conscience of the women of her time. Okay, and not only of her time, but also for us, because no matter how long it takes um, for me to go back to the book, when I go back, she, all, she always feels my heart, you know, because she, she wants my heart, because um, I think she's unique, right? If we think and consider the time in which she lived, and uh, in which she writes. Okay, so she she was she wrote about um, personal limitations. Um, she broke the codes and conventions of a time, and as we have seen, some people received it badly. Um, her writing work, but some others appreciated and she paved a way for future writers and also for um, readers. Okay, so that's it. Wow, thank you. Thank you.